Hello, everyone. Welcome to the um, November 12th, 2024 meeting of the planning board. Um, we now have a quorum, so we are just going to be here. Okay. Well, we have a quorum anyway, so we are going to um, get underway. The first thing we will do is do a roll call just to confirm everyone's here since we are hybrid today. Um, I will start with um, our individual online. Pat Nelson. I'm here. Rob Almeida. Here. Uh, Miller, here. Yep. And Sue Felsham. Here. Excellent. And with that, we can kick off our meeting. Um, first agenda item we have is the um, the draft uh, MBTA community zoning plans, community zoning site plan rules and regulations discussion. Um, so I am going to not take much of your time except to introduce uh, Emily Innes. She's with Innes Associates. She is your uh, consultant that we town staff has been working with to bring up this first uh, first draft. And I'm going to just turn it over to Emily. I don't know if you want me to, um, I know everybody received these. Um, I think they're posted online. Um, so I don't know if you want me to bring them up virtually since. Um, well, so you're providing the introduction to what these are. So what would make the most sense to bring them up or um, so people can see what we're talking about if we zoom in on a particular section? I think that's but... really a good idea. I think it'd be helpful. And I don't know if you're practicing me to come and join you or is here good enough? Can you hear me from here? Or should you prefer? Whatever is more comfortable. It's really easy to see you. Okay. Yeah. And then that way, you, where you are. And if you talk, you'll also be closer to the fish. Perfect. Owl. 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 I keep thinking fishbowl, but I know it's not the right term. <laughs> it's an owl. But it's an owl. Sorry. Okay. Great. Well, while you're pulling it up, I'm again, Emily Ennis from Ennis Associates. So, what we have in front of us today is the first full draft discussed with you. We've had two meetings with staff, one of them this afternoon. So I'll walk you through some of their comments. And then um, briefly now, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but the next steps would be obviously our discussion today. I would take both sets of comments back, put them into a next draft, um, make sure that that draft was okay with you all. So we talked about sending it back out again. Um, and then we will do a final review and submit it properly for your December 3rd meeting for the public hearing. So we uh, try and get the meet in there and then do the final sort of foolproof from the, the team um, at the very end because Microsoft Word and format changes are fun, let me tell you. <laughs> so, so with that, um, uh, so these site plan review rules and regulations are right now specific to your MBTA community zoning. Um, I think there's some thought that should they prove useful, successful, they could be further expanded, but for now they're for the MBTA communities. Um, I do want to stress that we'll talk about the general provisions and the purpose, but one purpose of these regulations is actually to make your lives easier. Um, applicants' lives easier and the public's lives easier because you all have a common set of sort of more explanatory standards and uh, requirements than maybe zoning is sometimes for people. So keep that in mind as you review it that this should be user friendly. So if you're finding that it's not, that's one of the things that we'd like to hear. So with the start here, the general provisions. Um, are primarily the sort of the administrative pieces around this. So you have the purpose and goals of the regulations themselves, uh, the authority that establishes them, what they're applicable to, uh, allowing for any waivers and how that process would be, allowing for any amendments, and then the effective date, which is the date of the adoption by yourselves, the planning board. So unlike zoning, uh, these do not go to town meeting. They're adopted by the planning board after the public hearing. And so that's where we start on December uh, 3rd. So uh, first question is, do you have any comments or changes to this particular section? I thought we'd do high level section by section and then we can zoom in if you have comments or want to have a discussion. So I I have a comment or a, a question and um, that is um, all uh, all um, potential changes in these MBTA communities would require site review. So that's a first look off. Is yeah. there any instance where 
you or Elizabeth, you would find it appropriate that um, an applicant need not go through site review. Could you say if someone has a home and they're not changing the dimensions to any significant extent, but just changing it from a single family into a three family home? Um, obviously, there'd be changes in parking requirements, but beyond that, why would we need to put um, that applicant through um, this review? And that that's like the simplest one. Right. It's probably never going to happen. But you know, between that and you know a four hundred unit development that might go up uh, 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 somewhere that, uh, else, mm -hmm. um, it, everybody's treated similarly. Um, would it be possible to bifurcate and have um, a simpler path for some applications versus um, uh, this, you know, more lengthy process um, that everyone would have to go to? And how did you think about that? How? And, yeah. And what other? What have other communities that have um, gone through the site? plan if there are I assume there must be since a number of communities are approved <clears throat> what have they done in those instances so it's an excellent question we talked about this a little bit in terms of waiving some of the requirements you giving giving you planning by the authority to waive some of the requirements for some of the smaller projects because you're right there's a big difference between a three unit building and a even a 20 to 50 um, and all the way up uh, there's a couple of different ways that communities have done this. Um, one is to establish a threshold for site plan review, um, not just the regulations, but the actual requirement. And obviously that's a zoning change. Um, within the regulations, I believe that you could also bifurcate it by, by um, saying for establishing another threshold and saying that under our rules and regulations, these rules would apply to a project of this size, and these rules would apply to a project of that size. So they're all going through site plan review. Um, that's re is required in the zoning, but um, uh, what applies to them is a little bit different. Um, so we could, one way to look at that is to say, what is the interest in um, the community for each of those sizes. So when you look at the types of things that are covered in site plan review, access, circulation, lighting, landscaping, et cetera, um, what, what levels should apply to a three family and what should apply to um, a six unit or a 10 unit or above. And so that might be one way of doing it is to look at the standards in here and decide if any of them feel more onerous for those smaller projects that you want potentially to make a little bit more streamlined, a little bit easier because they're perhaps not as um, frequent or not as sophisticated as some of the larger projects uh, in terms of an understanding of those requirements. So, so that's certainly possible to do. And we can talk about that a little bit as we go through. Some of these standards are pretty, or, or, or requirements in here are pretty standard for almost everything, but I think it's worth reviewing them with the idea that some of them might feel a little bit onerous for those smaller projects. So to follow up on your thought, Linda, I can see if it's a, a, a new three family, um, that a lot of these things would still apply for you know new construction. Right. I think your example is kind of the perfect example. You have you know right. a huge Victorian home and to modify that into a three family um, maybe you know, a couple of new doorways to the outside uh, and a, you know some additional um, parking. But other than other than that, everything's interior. So Um, it be, it becomes it becomes more challenging to go through the regs and figure out what's you know the different thresholds you know okay is it three to five and then it's six to ten and um, but that example of the you know just an interior conversion where you'd you'd want to see where's the parking going mm -hmm. is the parking you know screened is there landscaping but other than that it's 
um, you know, don't want to have, you know, huge pavement. So we'll look at some of the sustainability, you know, principles as, you know, you're using pavers and, or, you know, something else and you're not just paving you know, for six parking spaces. I, I think that would be a good, you know, a good way to approach that incrementally. Well, I agree. I think there would also be something probably in exterior lighting and maybe walkways, but but when it's building reuse, but then is it building reuse only for a three family or for any building reuse? If someone wants to take a commercial building that's large enough for 10 or 20 units and convert it without modifying the exterior except to add doorways, is it the well, same? That wouldn't really work very well, but I'm just wondering if it's about reuse of an existing building without changing the footprint and exterior significantly, or if it's about reuse of a building for a small, an existing home, say, like like the old mm -hmm. Victorian example. And you do have a general provision in here. I was just trying to see if we put it in twice, mm -hmm. but I think it's just in the one, in 1. 1.4 waivers that allows you, the planning board, to waive the strict requirements mm -hmm. of these regulations. So I think one thing to think about between now and the time that we send this back um, for additional comments to you is, do you think that waiver provision is flexible enough to address those circumstances? Or do you think it would be better that so the waiver provision is fine, but maybe we provide some more guidelines around something where it is, it is um, in effect, mm -hmm. the, modification of the reuse of an existing building. Maybe you need a little bit more information in here to know how to apply that flexibility. So that's something we can certainly work at. I, I I think we can we can all envision the you know the existing residential going to a single family to a three family um, and and easily figure out okay well we'd we'd still kind of like to see this and that but you know, no, you know, it's not stormwater drainage. It's not, you know, those elements. I think the conversion of a commercial building, I, I think that's, you know, has, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how, you know, you know how that would work because, you know, you, you, you know, how would the, you know, parking or, um, you know, mail or trash. I, I I think that one's a little harder for me to figure out. So it makes it more challenging to try and write something in the regs. That's that one's almost you know, if somebody proposes it and they go through it's oh okay now now I can see how that would work and and you know what you know what were the issues and the stumbling blocks or you know why it um was you know more challenging than it should have been. Um, yeah, I was really more meaning a larger home, but then halfway through my sentence, I realized none of them are in any of the MPVA districts. So I said commercial, but you're right. That's not really applicable. No, I, I guess mm -hmm. um, the, the point of this is to get more housing. Mm -hmm. So for modest, um conversions mm -hmm. it seems to me that we would want to signal that this is a a reasonable process without a lot of hoops and without requiring a waiver to, mm -hmm. to some extent i think that that adds uncertainty the pro to the process yeah, so i i would say you know would it be possible to have a you know, and it, it doesn't have to be a high um, or a very, I don't know, high or low. It doesn't have to be a threshold for a lot. But I think for a simple conversion, mm -hmm. um, that would seem to me uh, some it, sort of what the community was hoping we would get from mm -hmm. this process. So then let's make it so easier let's, to let's address make that it, value. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, easier, but uh, as you point out, um, um, the elements that are important to look at screen and, and parking yeah. and whatnot should also be included, but we don't have to talk about, you know, circulation and mm -hmm. stormwater drainage and okay. things that are, are probably, um, you know, 
So maybe it's just a, like a checklist or something. Oh. If you have, you know, uh, if you are converting and not adding any more than X percent to the mm -hmm. property, you know, like and people could bump out to have it entryway or something, um, right. not adding so much more and, um, you know, minimum addition of, of parking. Um, you have to do the following seven elements as opposed to 26 pages. Or I love checklists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because they make it so much easier for everyone. Okay. Yes. Um, we can look at that and we can look at the idea of what that percentage addition or rehab can be to keep it under the major rehab limits because once you trigger that you're triggering a whole host of other things right so, and, and yeah. what you know is everyone will go up to the you know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly so you know make it right tight but yes. not not like you can't add like i say a, a simple right. entryway where you could have three mailboxes or mm -hmm. something instead of the porch or whatever that mm -hmm. didn't count relatively minimal changes to the exterior um, relatively minimal changes to the site organization. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we can we can work on that okay. and come up with some options for you all to review. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the general provisions on the purpose and goals? Um, and I should say, I think we we talked about this when we first started, but but because of when that was. Um, you know, this has been a, a group effort from work that um, Elizabeth had started a while back. <laughs> while back. Mm -hmm. In addition to our own work and staff input. So there's a, a lot of voices being heard in this um, as you look through it. I, well, first I was remiss in my duties. I ran out of time and I have not gone all the way through the, the site plan rules and regs before this meeting, but I did get through this section and I had some small comments on wording of some things, um, which I will send in later. But there were a couple of things, especially in 1.1, um, I and J, where it says ensure that the site design is consistent with the surrounding neighborhood, mm -hmm. ensure that the architectural components are sympathetic to Concord's existing historic built environment. I'm a little worried that people might read that to say, uh, you know, everything has to be uh, traditional New England vernacular architecture. And well, you know, the massing has to be sympathetic. So therefore it has to I would, okay. That's I mean, why we, the existing yes. built environment includes multifamily developments right. because we already have them. But I'm still a little concerned that we might need to find different ways of phrasing that to not let people think it means, well, so we just can't have any multifamily. Right, exactly. And certainly sympathetic is a little bit closer to what we tried to get to with um, being more general. In other words, you want new buildings or additions to respond to the context, the existing mm -hmm. context, but you're definitely not looking for a Disneyland of, oh, we've got to build everything exactly the way it was. Well, and also um, I wouldn't want it to be more onerous for multifamily than it is exactly. for single family. And people can, and in my opinion, in some cases have built monstrosities in Concord because it's not my preference, but other people have different ones, but regardless, we don't right. regulate. So I thought sympathetic might even be a good word in I in instead of the consistent. Absolutely. And it's not a bad that, word yeah. in J except for architectural components. I'm not sure. It's, so if you look at the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Historic Rehabilitation, uh -huh. um, you know, they do want, they do ask that any new additions be distinguishable from the existing building, right? You always want to be able to do when you're doing historic preservation mm -hmm. to understand which was the original and which was the new. But the idea of carrying through architectural components, um, uh, organizations. So for example, if you have a building that has strong horizontal lines, you've got the, the corner, the, the 
division between first and second floor, and then you're putting an addition on or an infill building between the idea of carrying those horizontal lines. It's not going to look exactly the same, but you've got that yeah. same sort of organization. Um, you'll see it sometimes. I've uh, I've got a great picture that is sometimes pops up on my computer of um, uh, a city that that had. Um, uh, in fill in probably the 60s or 70s with much older architecture. So, of course, different scale from Concord, but the old architecture had very strong vertical lines. And you can see this new architecture, well, new in the 60s, replicated those strong vertical lines. So that's what we mean by architectural elements is, is replicate. Well, if there's a porch in the area, maybe there's a porch on the building, is trying to, to pull in some sort of sense of relationship. Well, I would certainly hope that would happen. It's yeah. just we don't require that for single family homes. So why should we have a more onerous standard for multifamily is all I'm saying. True. There's a lot of uh, things that are required for homes that aren't single family. It's harder to control single family. In fact, I don't think it's actually allowed under 3A unless you've got a local historic or under um, sorry, 40A, unless you've got a local historic district. But in terms of the massing and scale of a um, multifamily, maybe above that conversion, um, you know, you might want to be a little bit more sensitive to the architectural components without being a burden. So it's um, the the advantage of this, as opposed to a um, uh, historic district is that the requirements aren't mandatory. You're trying to give guidance to that. So you're saying we would like you to be sympathetic. We're going to be looking for that. But we can't mandate that you have specific materials or specific components. Um, just that we'd, we'd like to see that you respond to that. And anybody coming in is going to want to do something that they know that the board is, um, uh, is seeing as a value in the community. Well, I hope so. It's yeah. just we say ensure mm -hmm. that so the we architectural look at that wording there. is intent. Yeah. yeah, and that's all I mean. So yes, I mean, I, I, I think it's the intent is correct, but I'm a little concerned that the wording may. So I would say be um, discouraging to yeah, family. Yeah, absolutely. And knowing that you haven't had a chance to go through the whole thing, mm -hmm. certainly would welcome any com comments um, as you look through this. Maybe you'd like to send them through Elizabeth. I will. I will. Um, Don't any worry, suggestions? Don't worry. <laughs> you know, they, they will tell you she can't stop me, but you can always ignore me. <laughs> just with that, we have Pat on the line. Oh, yeah, got, right. um, her hand up. So I just want yeah, to I just, I just wanted to echo. Um, Sue's comments and would want to be sure that it wasn't that ensure the use of ensure wasn't an implication of it has to be mm -hmm. there are neighborhoods and I live in one of them um, cottage lane where there are very modern buildings side by side with 1865 cottages and it's a fascinating neighborhood so I just wouldn't want to see it I, I would like us to really consider that yeah, happy, happy to um, make this more consistent with your goals. So that'd be great. Yeah. Um, even I would ask you to um, take this forward mm -hmm. um, in shores here. And I notice in the rest of the document, there are a lot of shells. Zoning language. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think for site plan review um we where we cannot deny that we should have quite as many shells as so i'll mm -hmm. just say i'll let you okay, um, okay. think yeah. about that we can we can have the shall may should could yeah <laughs> <That's the laughs> option. Mm -hmm. absolutely And again, this is, you know, the initial review. So as you think of additional comments as we go through, please, we'll, we'll give you deadlines at the end of this meeting for when comments are due. So with that, I'm going to just keep moving us on in sections and we can always go back. But section two is the pre-application procedures. And um, Elizabeth, you might want to jump in on this, but what's um, I think particularly useful about this section is that it is putting in writing an existing process that the town has. Um, so it's clear to everybody what that process is. Uh, this is certainly something that we went back and forth on and discussed with staff to make sure that it was 
accurate um, uh, and you know uh, appropriately documented that existing process. But for those at home who may not be reading along, um, uh, it establishes a pre-application conference and a town staff review meeting, the submission requirements for that and um, the preliminary meeting with the planning board. None of these are binding on the applicant, but it's a chance for them to bring forward, hey, I'm thinking about this idea. I'd like to talk to you about what we're considering um, and uh, then to come to the planning board and get comments from the public and abutters on the proposal before submitting the full application. Um, anything I've missed in that? No, yeah. that's great. Um, yeah. What would be different about this pre-application procedure to other um, procedures um, in terms of if an applicant came forward with this and in a, an MBTA um, community zoning site versus not an MBA? It's, it's the same it's process. It's the exact same yeah. process. Yeah. And so it's there's written down here. It, this one just happens to be written down. Okay. But this is a process that has been in place um, all, all the years that I've been basically managing it. So um, for a subdivision, it would be the same? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I do appreciate it says non binding Like this is not required. It is, it, yeah, the process is not required. Just make it very clear this is binding, yeah. this is what people will look for. So if yeah. you do this, it will help. Yeah, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. and that's it, it phrased is, delicately. I like it. <laughs> you know, it's uh, so I have in the past been on a planning board. Um, this does make it so much easier because you're able to flesh out problems before they get to the public hearing stage, and then suddenly you're trying to deal with uh, a technical problem. Um, and the public hearing at the same time. So, you know, it, it is a great thing to have in a community. I'm, delight I'm delighted when I see communities <laughs> have this. Uh -huh. So congratulations. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, if there's anything in the language or any questions about the process as it stands, please let us know. So the next session, a uh, section rather, uh, section three sets up the site plan review procedures. So it's the application requirements, um, how to file, uh, how these uh, the application is referred to other town departments, divisions, or boards and committees, um, your review meeting and the timeline around that, the fees that the consultant, uh, sorry, the fees that the applicant have to pay, and then um, a section on outside consultant review fees and how that process works. Um, and you'll note that uh, some of this language is referring to appendices in the back. So right now, these are your existing um, appendices. And once we get everything sat in the front part, then we're going to go back and look at what needs to change in, in those uh, uh, appendices. So these are all requirements. And so here, are all the shalls yes, can stay. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And to your previous question, this is the process that's currently implemented, yes. this, um, whether you're in MBTA communities or not. Back to trying to keep it as similar as possible where we could. Yeah. Section four is administration. Um, it's uh, the filing of the approval. So we, we broke it down um, really in section three. It's kind of how do you get to the meeting with the planning board, the actual review with the planning board, and then section four is you've had that meeting, you've been approved, um, this is what happens. So the approval is filed, uh, what happens if it lapses, um, what happens if the board appeals, and uh, you'll see in my section, at least this is in yellow. Yes, I can see it is in yours as well. So there are a few things that we are continuing to check with um, uh, other staff members um, just to make sure that we've got the order right. And that's in yellow, because that's one of them. Um, and then the actual approval before the building permit and then any appeals, how appeals can be filed. And then section five is, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. So um, I guess I'm a little confused with where the state stands on having, um, special permits uh, allowed 
uh, in the MBTA communities at all. So what is your experience? So that's a, a, an ongoing conversation that town council is having with, because um, our town council represents a number of communities um, that they are currently having conversations with um, the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Um, and even as of last week, because I was letting town council know this will be coming, they will they will review them before you adopt them. Mm -hmm. um, it might not be, you know, by when you open the public hearing on the third, um, it may, you know, have to be continue it for two weeks, um, but they are of the strong opinion um, that um, Section 3A did did not override, you know, all all zoning. It 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 doesn't. Um, it you know, single family dwellings are permitted use. Um, floodplain. If you choose to you know build in a floodplain, you have made that choice. It's not doesn't preclude you from you know your aisles of right use. Be no different with a single family dwelling or a multi family dwelling. Um, so they you know. Uh, they are of the strong opinion that yes, you can require them to get a special permit if they choose to build in the floodplain or if they choose to build in an aquifer protection zone district. You're not precluding them from developing. Um, the other reason for keeping this language here, um, I'm I'm certainly not going to get between you and town council. I, I usually have at least one time when I'm talking to a planning board of saying, I am not a lawyer. So this is yes. my, I am not a lawyer. But I will say that because we also viewed this as setting you up for at some point, you might want to expand this to all of the districts in the town, having that language there to um, coordinate what happens with the Board of Appeals if they have a special permit. Um, or if they're granting a, a variance would be very helpful to have it here, even if it did not apply to the MBTA communities. So, um, uh, but that's why it's in yellow is because the conversations are still happening. And and, the, and so the, the, the same argument holds true with other elements. You know, there's the maximum height is 35 feet. Somebody can choose to get a special permit and request a waiver from the Board of Appeals. That's a special permit. Um, so I so I think um, but you know I am gonna follow up formally with town council when they review this. Okay. If absolutely necessary, we could change to it to required pursuant to another section of the bylaw and as allowed under state law, and that would that could, uh, make it applicable, cover, yeah. and if the state declared, well, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have to change our side plan rules right. and regs. Yeah, yeah. that's true too. <laughs> so it's always interesting when you're when you're setting something up for what you know is going to be a phase two and figuring out how to word it appropriately and what sections you need. Mm -hmm. So. So section five is the design standards. I have fewer shells put up uh, <laughs> right next to it now. And um, uh, as you can possibly see by the amount of black ink on here, uh, um, the members of town st staff that we spoke to this afternoon did have uh, some comments relative to their areas of expertise. So just introducing it in general, you'll see that um, these sections are really following those components of uh, site plan review and approval. So the access, circulation, landscaping, lighting, stormwater management. Um, there are some design components that you'll see just relating to building massing and relating to the buildings relating to each other. Um, uh, and that uh, many of those were actually pulled from the um, sample zoning, anything like that would have been pulled from the sample zoning that was developed from 3A so that there would be consistency there. Um, some of the comments that we received, uh, just to let you know, uh, on plantings, we had uh, a conversation about making sure that we're just referring to the correct organization and documentation. Um, we talked about defining what to the maximum extent feasible actually means somewhere in the documents. Mm -hmm. So because that is the sort of thing that gets put into documents like this all the time, 
but very few communities actually define it. So we're going to look into that. Um, we also talked about refer referring back either to existing applications, such as the driveway permit application that has some of these standards in there rather than being repetitive because they're going to have to apply for that or potentially apply for that anyway. Um, and also pointing back to some of the standards in your existing by zoning bylaw. So for example, parking, um, pointing back to not just the parking requirements of two spaces per dwelling unit, but also, you know, how parking is laid out, the size of the parking spaces, et cetera, just to make sure that there's a tie back to the zoning. Um, we're still talking to a couple of departments um, to, to get their input. Uh, let's see what else. Erosion control, stormwater drainage and management. Again, there's some other documents that we can point back to. Um, and we discussed uh, how to set up appropriate maintenance of stormwater um, uh, infrastructure um, just to make sure that it is uh, maintained properly. And then finally, in terms of sort of the overall view, we looked at um, uh, a couple of things, uh, adding an application form to, or a component to the application to require an estimate of the uh, load on the electrical um, infrastructure so that CMLP knows oh, kind of in advance what it's likely to be. Are you um, on the appendix now? Or? No, I'm on oh, no. page 16. I'm just, I'm just running oh, through I my see. notes Sorry. from the conversation. Okay. Then we can go back and start. Okay. Um, so uh, CMLP or the representatives of CMLP found, said that sometimes applicants don't find out that there might be a disconnect no pun intended, between <laughs> uh, what they want to do and how much capacity there might be a particular site. And similar for um, wastewater, having them complete the, either the form S or C, depending on whether they have septic or um, uh, sewer, so that there's an understanding of what the um, capacity is on the site early on in the process. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you don't also want to be in the situation of approving something and then have the applicant come back and say, ah, I didn't know X. So where we can getting as much information as possible. And then um, just to sort of finish covering the general things, we had put a provision in the as-built plans, which is section 5.14 that the um, engineers will need to sign off um, this is C, uh, or what should be C, um, uh, that they'll submit a, a letter uh, issued and stamped by the reg registered professional engineer saying, stating that the as-built plan is consistent with the plan reviewed and approved by the planning board for the building commissioner. We're just adding some language around that to make it even tighter. Um, this just makes it easier for you um, sort of in future reviews and also there was a request that we require the site plan in AutoCAD format, which would help several departments out if they had that, so. Which is interesting going back to Linda's earlier point about what if it's just a simple conversion requiring as-built plans for all of these things might be highly onerous. We talked about that and, so, and sort of bounced that back and forth for that exact reason. Mm -hmm. And it was generally, I think the general consensus was site plans almost always going to be an AutoCAD because they're having to do parking and access and all of that. Building plans, however, are not likely to be. So we're really focused on the site plan here rather than mm -hmm. building plans and elevations. The Department of Health noted that it's helpful for them to have the building plans, but that they don't need them in CAD. Mm -hmm. um, but for the for the so the engineering, lighting, wastewater, those are all, oh, sorry, not wastewater, stormwater, those all are very helpful to have in CAD because of the type of infrastructure that needs to be, you know, understood exactly where it's placed on site. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that's a standard, that's currently a standard condition okay. for all yeah. state plans. All right. I was just trying to think of somebody who is trying to um, just okay. take their big old Victorian that's got five doors right. and so enough parking where... for 10 cars. Right. And do they really need to submit things in AutoCAD? Well, maybe if they need to prove they have an septic, but if they're on the sewer system, maybe not. 
that could be that waiver of a provision. You could say, okay, this waiver, isn't going yeah. to, to, you know, we don't need this. And and when I say waiver, you know, that's a waiver of the documentation. It's not a waiver of a requirement. You're saying right. we don't need that. So right. we've given you that flexibility. But it's a very good question. So mm -hmm. um, there's something else we talked about that would be useful in this section. Let me just I put it on the front page. Oh, maximum feasible compliance. Um, that's again Board of Health and um, has to do with septic sizing of septic systems relative to what's built. So so we're going to be tweaking some of the language in these in these areas, just so you know. But if you have any questions on any of the sections here, um, yes. So under siting and appearance, yes. I was wondering if you might want to add siting. Um, suitable for solar oh, yeah. um, would be desirable and also for geothermal. I don't know if siting makes a difference because I don't know enough about geothermal, but solar. It did talk about somewhere about energy state, generation. The yeah. sustainability section. Yes. Which is going to be five. A net zero operating. Yeah, that's what it was. 13. Yeah. Like high efficiency, high quality. Yeah. Right. It says strive to achieve including on site renewable energy production, right. which could be taken to include solar orientation, but. Right, but you. But you maybe would, it would be would, helpful to say it outright. You, you uh, could. It's just you wouldn't necessarily want to turn a house 40 degrees on a lot and shrink it by one unit so that way it's perfectly sited for solar it's just like something you consider with roof lines, right, right but you know? would certainly want to consider yeah. whether the roof goes this way or that right. way yeah. yeah and again of course that's going to depend on whether you're converting an existing right. building yes. you right. have much choice right. they're not chopping the roof off and exactly. turning yeah. Back, but yeah twisting it yeah <laughs> what um, I putting out very large poles <laughs> <laughs> and then also um Again, I don't know if this would make any sense, but if you are, um, say, move, uh, is, with, I guess, parking and um, uh, entering and exiting the property, mm -hmm. um, you would want that siting, if it's going to change, to have a minimum impact on traffic yes or, and or we, maximum mm -hmm. you know visibility so i'm i might i don't know yeah. i'm sure that's also oh that's in here in, in uh, 5.4 5.4 5 about driveways yeah. and site distance and parking and screening mm -hmm. and integration of right you know different things and yeah. some of this will change a little bit because uh a lot of it is covered in the driveway permit application. So okay. we're just going to go back and take mm -hmm. a look and see what we keep in here and where we just point to the application. But yes, um, I agree that's an important consideration. Um, so I think what I'd um, probably like oh. to suggest um, is after today's meeting, um, Emily and I over the next week um, will make a, quite a few revisions, send out the rough draft. And if anybody has you know, comments, you know, send them in. And we'll do an, another rough draft for your meeting. I think you actually have a meeting in two weeks. Um, Emily won't be there, but we can have just another conversation. It'll give you a little bit more time to review and digest everything. And have another conversation. Make another round of another round of changes. Um, interesting. Yes. Um, Mr. Nardi, are you? Um, I'm not sure how you're making edits to my screen. <laughs> I'm not sure either. I was I was doing it on my own behalf. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. It's the first time I've ever seen that. So there you go. Um, 
Gotta love technology. <laughs> and I was also oh, on, on, on low impact development. Yes. Putting roof gardens. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, we've done um some. It does reference some other language towards it references roof gardens towards outdoor space. I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I think it said that. It says shared outdoor space oh. can be courtyard, rooftop, terrace, ground floor, but it does not specifically say roof gardens. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, something else we've been working with is um, green and blue. Roof. Yeah, green roofs. yeah, green roofs and blue roofs. So, okay. ah, blue roofs actually store. You don't want to require this from BTA. It's probably a little bit expensive, but actually stores the stormwater on the roof itself. So cool. structural load. Yeah. Um, and then gradually releases it. It's quite yeah. often combined with a green roof, but oh. um, you know, you're not requiring it. So we can just mention that that's something it's that you're like to see. Yeah. And other people oh. or other developments are combining <laughs> green roofs with solar. So you can have solar on your rooftop oh. and a green roof. And actually, it works out quite well. Then you so, get shade. Yes, exactly. So, oh, and then another thing. I'm sure it's in here, but I didn't see. It. Um, um, in terms, well, I was looking at outdoor lighting, but but I was um, thinking something about signage and wayfinding for larger uh -huh. um, projects. Really, should ask them to. Um, I'm sure people do focus on it, but we really don't mention it in terms of mm -hmm. uh, suggestion that there be, um, you know, if, if there are a variety of different mm -hmm. locations for housing or whatever that when people you know, like if it's project, multi uh, it should say you need one through ten this yeah, way. Units. Yeah. Do so you I don't allow know. for a signage master plan in your sign bylaw? I it no, would allow. No, no, yeah, it allows a, um, somebody with multiple buildings or tenants or whatever to come in and submit a single um, plan for signage and then they can just implement it as it goes, right? So you sort of approve everything at once. We can talk about that. <laughs> you require me to read the sign by law. Yeah. <laughs> or possibly you're going to require me to read the sign by law. <laughs> but yes, we can yeah. we can talk about yeah. that and that yeah. I think okay. it work out well for those. Because that way they just come into you once and it's just a building permit after that. They say, here's our signage plan. We're putting this sign up here. And the you know building department says, okay, we see it on the plan. We see that you're putting up. Right. So and and then also under, I guess under sustainability, mm -hmm. um it I think it says earlier on uh that it, it's advisable to have materials that are reused, but under sustainability, maybe with regard to any demolition, mm -hmm. to add something about reuse of uh, yeah, demolishment or materials that were coming out of the demolition okay. itself. Yep. Okay. Um. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Still, green building. You just turn on the heat. My mother has a cake in Well, thank you. I do appreciate you coming by and uh, explaining what you're doing. And so you and we will provide any comments we have directly to Elizabeth, who will filter them as part of your next round of discussions. I think that's the easiest way to deal with it. Yes, that. I think so. Not to put more work on Elizabeth, but it makes it. When, when will we get the amended copy? That you... So Elizabeth's asked me to give it to her by November 20th so that she can review it. And I assume give it to you relatively yeah. soon after that. Perfect. And then, um, uh, then I'll get your next set of comments. We'll review them again and reincorporate them. And then I think we talked about a week before December 30th, um, getting it 
December. 3rd. I mean, December third. Sorry, yeah. three. There's not three zero. Uh, December third, we would get them two a week before, so you have them on plenty of time. We don't need to take public comment. Okay. And then we'll take some public comment. Um, we have um, Steve Weber online. Or Sven, Sven, sorry, Sven here. Weber. I read it fast. Yes, yeah, Sven Bebo, um, 50 Bernard Street. Um, I'm chair of the Public Works Commission, and I'm just asking um, with respect uh, to Public Works here is, uh, is Public Works uh, Engineering having uh, getting a chance to review this to make sure that the wordings, specifically if you look down in sections like Stormwater and others, um, yes. are satisfactory to them? Yes, they have um, all um, town staff from the um, different um, seven, eight. So um, <laughs> engineering, water and sewer, police, fire, uh, health, building, natural resources, mm -hmm. and CMLP have all collaborated on this document. Um, in fact, we met today okay. at three. So um, thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. I don't know if we had any other questions online. I'll just no one wait one sec. I don't think anybody. So and there's no one in the room. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. I'll see you in December. Awesome. Oh, I did have one more question. Oh. <laughs> sorry. sorry. I looked at the um, appendix. We need to get separate appendix. Um, Oh, oh, I think it was C. I brought this up once long ago and far away. All this fee schedule is from 2018. And yes. I wondered if they were industry standard no. or should we be asking people to offset some of the valuable time that staff and our consultants are. So plus well, a side note, um, so we've already started a um, fee application fee review, um, and we'll be putting together a um, consolidated um, proposal to the town manager for all of our application fees that are in the planning division. Um, but I think um, it may be all four divisions in this building. And we'll also be looking at that, but that's um, that's already being being done right um, but, but i can tell you you um for some projects um you cannot charge an application fee that covers all of town staff funds no no, so, no no but but, but we but um yeah but we are looking at you know i don't know how many towns you know we'll that usually it's six to ten you know comparable towns but that's in the works Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you again. Sorry about that. Thank you. No worries. Yeah. When we I'd look like at it. comparable towns, do we also ask them, and are you thinking about changing your fees? Because, <laughs> you know, if everybody does it all at once, based on what everybody used to be saying, uh, things won't budge. Um, Just wondering. Yeah. That would be more work for you to have to ask them. So I'm not demanding that you do. I think, I think it also just... Asking when the last time they touched it. Yeah. We'll, it right. we'll, we'll tell you that too. Exactly. 2018, you'll say, okay, we'll take that with a grain of salt. Yes. Yes. Seven years old. Yeah, yeah. At least. Usually, they, when they publish them, they do have a, a, a date, date on it. No, no. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. So that would do like catch up, but I'm sure other towns are too. Um, the next item on the agenda is the potential BRD bylaw uh, affordability requirement amendment. And we have Matt Johnson here. Hello. So you want me to bring it up, Matt, when you're ready? Yeah, Sorry. I think that would be good. Yeah, I'm not on the Zoom, so I can't share. Oh, I, oh, guess that's fine. I guess I could I could get on the Zoom. No, no, I don't mind. Okay. Don't yeah, there are not that many slides, so I, I think mind. I could just say. Oh, you're on the Zoom. Next. Well, so uh, just to start, it's kind of an unusual situation to have a member of the Concord Housing Foundation come here uh, trying to relax the criteria <laughs> Uh, for affordability, but that's actually not uh, unprecedented uh, in that if you make the criteria too tough, then units don't get generated. So if you change the criteria, you can motivate uh, development. That That's the underlying thought here. So if, I don't know if you can bring up the presentation, but um, we can just go 
So there's actually a relatively straightforward change that we could make to the zoning bylaw that I think could help with this process. And so uh, if you move to slide two, just to give some background, the over the probably past few decades, uh, Concord's affordable housing policy has really been to try to uh, achieve or maintain over 10% of uh, the units that would qualify in the state subsidized housing inventory. And that process, I mean, we didn't quite make it in the 2020 census, so 40 Bs took over, and of course that flipped things quite quickly. Um, and so thanks to at least one and probably two of those projects, um, we're suddenly quite a bit above the required levels. Now, it's not like we couldn't still use more affordable housing in town, but when you look at the housing that is out there uh, that is restricted, um, there's an imbalance in terms of the units that are uh, uh, restricted at the 80% of area mean income uh, versus uh, those that are at what we would call the workforce housing levels. That's the 100% the of the uh, AMI or above. And so um, what, and, and this has been recognized elsewhere in town. And, and so for example, the town manager recently designated $500,000 to the generation of workforce house. So, um, you know, when, what we need, then that motivated me to look at our zoning bylaw and go, well, does our zoning bylaw support the generation of workforce housing? And actually for most housing types, you have as a planning board, as the ZBA, uh, a, a lot of flexibility as to what you can consider to be affordable. However, when it comes to the PRD, that's where it's more specific. And so that's where I focus this work effort. So first let's see what we're talking about in terms of, uh, so the next slide, what we mean by workforce housing and, and the household income limits. So it may be a little eye-opening to see that, you know, because of inflation, uh, you know, and just increases in incomes in the region, that um, you know these limits are potentially quite high. And at the highest threshold, uh, you know, go go up to two hundred forty-four thousand for a family of four. That's the the absolute highest threshold. But um, and and it's actually higher than two years ago. The median income. Uh, for a household in Concord. Uh, today, you would expect it would be around 200,000. There's no actual data, but if you just used inflation. And uh, also for the sake of comparison, the average household income in Concord in 2022 was 260,000 and probably is around 300,000 now, close to 300,000. So, um, and then if you go to the next slide, you'd say, well, what do we need to do? So it's to revise the income range of the PRD unit types that would qualify for a density bonus. And what this does is it gives developers the opportunity to increase density if they offer 10% of their units or more at 110 to 150% of AMI, as opposed to today, you have to flip between 80% and this higher range. Um, and then to reduce or eliminate, hopefully, the need to subsidize these units, because you can imagine at these higher income levels, it becomes more problematic to have taxpayers subsidize these units. On the other hand, if you look at market rate units, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see that market rate today is above that 150% of AMI. So it actually, the goal here is not so much affordable housing, it's less extravagant housing, okay? And, and so if you look then at where we are with restricted units, there are only 36 total units restricted in town 
at this 100 to 150% range, as opposed to, um, what was it, uh, uh, could be up to 471 at the 80% level or below. So, you know, this is an area where we in the zoning bylaw could focus for the next few years and try to get more units that were in this range. Um, and what, how I came up with these unit prices is that Liz Rust has a spreadsheet. She is titled, I think, Naturally Affordable. <laughs> and what it does is it looks at mortgage rates, down payments, um, you know, uh, expected maintenance costs and things. And then it calculates what the household income required uh, at, at a 30% level of payment would be. And that's how you qualify what a affordable unit is. And so, in fact, these prices would vary if interest rates changed, those thresholds change. Um, so right now, with interest rates relatively high, believe it or not, these are lower than they would be otherwise, the affordability of a unit. So, um, so these are the kinds of units that we would hope to try to, to generate those of like one bedrooms in the 375 range and all this stuff. And, it, and in fact, if you look um, at recent sales, the some of the sort of unrenovated older condos do sell at like the 110 to 150 range today, but for new units, they're significantly higher. Um, so uh, what then is the specific change that I'm suggesting? So on slide six, um, it's that today with, you know, every other unit that is an affordable unit flips between having to be at the 80% level or between 110 and 150. What I'm suggesting is that instead we refer to the two paragraphs that are within this um, less affordable category and have starter price housing. That's what we've defined the 110% to be, to be the first, third, and fifth units. And then moderate priced housing, which is 150% threshold, be the even numbered units. And so you can see in the next slide what the current provisions look like in the bylaw. So they just say that if at least 10% of the units are made available as described in section 10.2.3.1, that's the so-called low income dwelling units, that's the 80% units. And then if they also 10.2.3.2, that's the whole section that includes both tiers of the other affordable units. And so we don't really, in the current bylaw, specify which of the two less affordable tiers that the every other unit has to qualify for. We just say it has to be in this overall range of higher affordability. And um, what I'm suggesting now is that we change the language so we just, instead of pointing at 10231 and 10232, we just point at 10232A and B, okay? All right, so like go to the next slide, you'll see um, the, the proposed wording change. So if 10% of them are described in subsection, as described in section 2, 10.2.3.2, if only one's required, it'll be as in par paragraph A. If two or more, then every other unit will be in 10.2.3.2. Oh, paragraph B. No, Whoops. no, no. It's correct. As, it's correct. Oh, as described. Okay. Yeah. yeah. B. Yeah. It should be A. It, it should be A. Right. At least 50% of them have to be A. Yeah. Right. Meaning that the rest of them are B. Okay. So that's it. It's just really changing about four words uh, in the bylaw, but it does change the policy. So, um, and uh, yeah, so we, we I, I'm just here now as me, but um, what I'm hoping, I mean, you know, I don't want to walk in as a, just some guy and propose a bylaw change. 
ideally is the planning board that's sponsoring such a change. So, oh. so, um, so if you really, um, so have you thought um, of just changing the density? Forget about the density as a bonus. Why not just allow greater density overall in PRDs? Well, then you might get higher density uh, extravagant housing. In other words, instead of having some affordable units, you want to give an incentive to make some of the units more affordable. Um, so currently in the PRD, if you right. build a PRD at basic density, um, there's no affordability requirement. So right. they could be right. you know, $1.2 million condos. In and fact, it are. likely would be. <laughs> yeah. So, so are, what we're trying to say so. is there's usually an equation that a developer does of like, look, if I could build more units, but I have to give up some of my profits on some of them, will I still have a higher total profit if I build more units total? And that's what they we're trying to get the equation so that it, it tips in the favor of yes, I will but, build more units, including some affordable ones, because my total profit will still be a little bit higher. Make so it up on volume. The, so the, the thesis is they're building all the units that they possibly can, right? To get to maximize their profits, they're building all the units. They always will. They always will. You'll never find a PRD that doesn't fully right. build out the property. So um so you're saying that the I don't know if you want to call it the luxury or the high end units um, are what are most profitable. So they aren't going to make ever make smaller units and achieve the same profitability. More smaller units because aren't... you're not going to do more work to get the same amount of money. I mean, in other words, they would still just make those big units on the smaller lot. Bio, I mean, in the PRD, yeah. right, you're pulling the... the you're, right, you're... I'm just... So... I, I see. So there's there's no way we can get them to make smaller lots. Well, smaller units. They're units. units. They're not really lots. Yeah, smaller okay. units. So smaller units. Um, the only... The, so... Uh, well, there's another zoning, provision. Zoning, zoning on zoning on the fly is is uh, never am, a good thing. No, no. Um, we're not however, zoning but on the fly, we're just right. talking about so how, what well, other options. Right. No, but we do have priorities. a current provision that says if they're under 2,500 square feet, you could also get a density bonus. That's already there. So, and that's never been used. No. Ah. Okay. That's right. And then we also say that if that's a first floor bedroom right. and all that you could also do a qualify for a density bonus. Yeah. But okay. you know, this affordability provision, we have had PRDs that use the affordability provision. So the current mm -hmm. current provision increases beyond the basic density within the planned residential development may be authorized by the board based upon one or more of the following. Um, section A is the uh -huh. affordability requirement. B is if at least 50% of the units are less than 2,500 gross square feet with not more than a one-car garage. And C, if at least 50% of the units are zero-step entry with master bedroom and full bathroom on the first floor. So I don't those, know that those, those aren't producing the results of actually generating more affordable units or more dense. Like th these aren't actually doing anything. So the idea is that this tweak would effectively maybe generate units in the missing middle. Yeah. And therefore possibly have a good effect. It, it could. We tried and, everything else. And there's also town money that's been set aside for this tier of units. And so if we have that too and could you know, throw a little bit in, let's say for the starter homes, you might be able to throw a little bit in towards that. That might further sweeten the deal and make it more doable. So, but it seems like 
everything that we've tried to sweeten the deal doesn't seem to be working. So my so my other question is, so if, if I buy an affordable unit and I decide to sell it, what happens to the affordability component? Does it go with the unit? Yes. Usually yeah, it does, users, yes. So well, there are some older ones where it didn't always, but now they do. Okay, so, so if I um, buy a unit, it has an affordability constraint. I then can only sell it also with the affordability constraint. So I, I can't profit from appreciation. Is that well, I don't think you much. can, but it's well, still going to be, a, it'll be proportionate because you paid less so you get less out. But but nevertheless, if the market has gone up, you will get the percentage wise increase in the market. But you can't just sell it for market rate. You can't just sell it to anybody. I know. I can't. Yeah. So I can't. But you also have market. built equity, and so you get so your I equity have, out. I have built equity. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So so say I I don't just help me with the numbers here. Okay. So say um. The market rate on a unit is a million dollars, or I don't know. I'm trying to think. Yeah, yeah, a million. So that's where I'm million dollars. Um, but I get it as an affordable unit at. Eight, Call it half a million. Oh, well, well eight hundred thousand. Okay, eight hundred thousand. Let's try. Right. I, I don't know. Yeah, that was let's try it. At eighty yeah. percent. So, so then, um, say market rate. I don't know how that's calculated. I guess some index is applied. Market rate then goes to a, a million two. Yeah, and then my I'm allowed to sell that unit for twenty percent appreciation, so yeah. nine hundred and sixty thousand. How does no, that so, work? So, so for um, deed restricted affordable units, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, that is based on um, how you know HUD sets, um, you know, sets the area median incomes. So, you know, we are part of the Boston Cambridge. Is it Brockton? Or... So if yeah. you bought it at 110% <laughs> yeah. now, so, and then yeah. in five Quincy. years, Quincy. 110% Quincy. is something different. It's whatever it is now. Right. No, it plus, later. plus whatever your, yeah. whatever interest you paid down, whatever mortgage principal you paid down. Right. So you're still, you're still building equity and you're still getting some gain, whatever that gain is. But the unit is still designated as affordable, and it's been built. Okay, I guess I'm just wondering if the reason that this isn't working is not that there's not um, that it that it's a part of the equation is demand. That is no, there's plenty of demand. no, no. It's it's availability. There's plenty of demand. There's still aren't any units. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. So there there have been almost no like purchasable affordable units generated in Concord over the last 20 years. I, I mean, there are a few, but handful, but just a handful. I think I read well, a statistic Matt, that said, all, almost everything that. else has been rental. Well, Matt, you said more units is always a higher profit, but I think part of the problem is that that's not actually true. You get a higher profit over well, building a smaller number 10, of giant. No, but it's units. 10%. Only ten percent have to be affordable yeah. to hit this. So, so, so let's say you you have let's say basic density is ten units. Okay, so now you're saying okay, if I offer ten percent of my units at affordable, I can build you know more density. Well, you can go up to double density. Right. All right. So now, if I offer a affordable unit. How many more units? Well, it, by the way, it's a negotiation. It's up to double, but mm -hmm. you know, you you could justify building three more units, maybe if you offer it for we heard whatever their market rate. So hey, you know, it, it really could pay off. Mm -hmm. Now it's a lot harder to make it pay off. And if you go to slide uh, five, you know, the buy down uh, required or the investment, if it's the developer paying for it. It is a lot different depending upon which of these tiers it is. So, if you know, roughly, of course, it varies based on unit size, but overall, on average, 
that like uh, a 150% AMI unit is around a 100K investment to generate it versus market rate. Whereas it's 500K a unit at the 80% level. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big hit that you have to recover from by making it up on the volume. Whereas with, if you're going back and forth between a 350K and a 100K, it's an average of, you know, 200K or so that you're investing, 225 uh, per unit. Well, then, yeah, you might be able to make it up on volume. So that's the idea. So should we then, instead of 10%, require 20%? Well, you know, it's 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 tricky because like whatever you you play with those numbers it if it makes it hard to achieve then you're not going to generate the house what, uh, what the way i've seen these things play out is or I've, I've read about them and and concord's kind of an example when you look at the numbers of current units if you are very worried it's going to go you're not going to get as many units as you can out of the stone the develop you know, like you're not going to get as much blood as you can out of the developer you're not going to get them to do exactly what you want them to do they're not going to do anything so the issue becomes if we do something like this i'm not saying this is like perfect or whatever i, I personally think it's good but because it's a change that could produce a result if all of a sudden you're producing too many units, that's the moment you say, whoa, maybe we screwed it up and we back off to 20%. But I don't think throwing it at 20% where you have no history of anybody building any is necessarily the right place to start because you have to show that it can have a result. Yeah. Well, the other thing I'd say is, you know, think back to that 500K that's out there. That what I'd use the 10% is that's where the developer invests. But to get it up to 20%, maybe the town throws some money in. Then you get it up above the 10% units. You know, that's an idea of how to sort of co-invest to make it happen. Um, one question I did have, what's the composition of those units? Are we looking at mostly two bedrooms? Three bedrooms? Well, it depends on the development, but our PRD bylaw says that you need a diversity of dwelling units. So they can't all be two bedrooms. They have to be a mix. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of producing more workforce housing, which we have a terrible deficit of. And I like the idea of producing more housing that's affordable or at least, you know, less unaffordable. <laughs> Things change. I'm thinking about five or 10 or 15 years down the line when we are no longer at um, such a high percentage of units that qualify for the SHI, assuming that um, both of our uh, 40 Bs go forward. It's hard to change the zoning bylaw. It takes time. Anything that adds an affordability requirement on a developer feels like a taking to them. Um, and I, I be, this be, yeah, because no. this is a density bonus requirement. No, so it's not, but it's still that's hard not, to they, change the signing. They, they don't have a right to it. So well, you're saying. You're, and that's a helpful thing. But still, I'm wondering if we should write it in right now in the change that we would make if we went forward to this with this to say, as long as the number of S, the percentage of SHI units is above, I don't know, 11% or 12%. Then this language applies, but if it gets drops below that, um, then the current language applies, so that we automatically snap back to requiring only giving the bonus for an eighty percent unit if we're getting uh, dangerously close to dropping below the ten percent threshold of units for the SHI. So I mean, we don't get a lot of affordable units out of PRDs, but um, you'll 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 know long before the years federal years. census in 2030. Yeah, but right, it's going to be 2040 because if we get to 16 yeah. percent, you, you you're will, done for yeah. 2030. Yeah, you're going to make no it problem. over that hump. Well, I will point out that we knew long before this last time, and yet what did we do? Nothing. Well, remember there, there was there was there was a developed that didn't go through. It was, 
for counting um, the chickens. Yeah, but anyway, I'm just saying uh, you're, you're not likely to need to revisit this due to the numbers during the, due to the SHI problem for 18 years uh, the, minimum. And and I've been on the planning board for I don't know three years. We, we've had one PRD. This isn't like things that are flying off the shelf that that were constantly fending off developers trying to do high density, trying to, you know, it's the incentives we have aren't working. So no one's doing it. So I don't see a real problem with tweaking the incentives and seeing if it works. And then, you know, it, I, I don't know. I, I just, I feel like there's less risk in making making it a little sweeter and seeing what happens. Well, um, oh, I was also, objecting to make no, no, no. But, but you know what I mean, like, like, and then time. the problem is with springing things like that. It, it's just more complicated. It's more time with town council to try to figure out whether you can even do that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Can can can, can, the, can the can know. the zoning bylaw have springing requirements like that? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure um, mm -hmm. because it's not treating all the units the same all the time. Mm. You know, it's it's you're treating them in, in, in different circumstances based on things that are not contained in the code. I, I you know, I don't point. know. Mm. Um, we have a we have a person with their hand up who's mm. been very patient, Keith Bergman. Uh, hi, Keith Bergman, chair of the Concord Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. And I just wanted to say that the trust has voted unanimously to support uh, Matt's uh, proposal. Uh, we find that it uh, supports the uh, uh, the town's uh, workforce housing goals. The select board has a goal to uh, diversify the the, uh, the housing stock, uh, including uh, workforce housing. Uh, the housing trust is looking uh, in general, not not just uh, for the for some five hundred thousand dollars we're getting in an ARPA. Uh, grant from the town, but uh, but also with our other unrestricted funds, uh, we're looking at uh, adding workforce housing. So we thought that this zoning proposal was entirely consistent with what we're trying to do. And uh, we uh, thank uh, Matt for taking the time to put it together uh, and uh, and hope that uh, and we uh, hope that uh, this uh, uh, is uh, something that the planning board is interested in. Thanks so much. Thank you. So I, I just want to add my two cents as a select board member that we have, are aware of this and also believe it's the right thing to do. And I actually personally think it's a great incentive to build more, at least some more affordable housing, not quote unquote affordable, but the workforce housing that we've talked about. So it's worth trying. And in terms of Future changes, I, I don't, we've got so much lead time on these things changes. I don't really think that you need to sort of set any kind of trigger mechanism in your regulations. It's, you got plenty of time. I mean, this could also lay groundwork for when MCI is available. Well, I was actually thinking of Peabody School mm -hmm. as, as an example of, of development that could benefit from this. Anyway, that's where we're at. So, uh, you know, if if you all want to adopt this and run with it, I am psyched. You know, uh, that's you don't that want to give the success. presentation at town meeting. <laughs> you all be fine. I prefer if you did it. I would be willing to do it if you don't want to do it. But you know, it always makes sense if the planning board's presenting a zoning change. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I don't know if you want to. Vote or you know now or later or something, uh, but I guess we we could take a straw vote to see if it's something that we are interested in pursuing. Is that appropriate at this point? I think if if, um, if you are, I mean, you're you're getting to the point where I'd like to um, send off lock it down and send it off and send them off to town council. But mm -hmm. still, the um, out yeah, um, the um, one that the. C is proposing, um, and um, I think they are also, um, EVC is also interested in pursuing something else uh, with, for town meeting, and then the next, the last one you have would be um, moving forward with something for um, parking. So mm -hmm. we can, you have a few that can go to town council now, um, and you could have those reviewed. And, and ready to go. So, 
and move it down to the board. Well, I guess um, I'll put it to a, a vote if anyone is anyone has any um, objections, I guess, to moving forward. I personally think it's a good idea to change the incentives because we're not getting any units. Well, and you don't mean both votes as in no, no, it's just it's, straw poll. It's yeah. like a straw poll. Just saying, yeah, yeah. personally, I think that we should move forward with with having this um, looked at by town council to see if it's something that's viable and that that the language appears appropriate for getting the incentives changed to try to get more units. I don't know if anyone else would like to chime in and say this. So, I guess all those in favor, a straw poll, not an actual yeah. vote. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think that's the route to go is to have it looked at. And We'll go from there. And what about Pat online? Thinks yeah, it's a, a good idea to have town council look at it and um, and then proceed with it. I see no reason not to. Great. So with that, um, we have a oh sorry. Uh, I would like to see perhaps even some of the other components where their density bonuses provided looked at to see if we can um enhance uh, them as well. I don't know. Um, even well, like the three, the three um, provisions, I think. Oh, you mean like the ground floor, yeah, like I mean, the small there, size and the- yeah, yeah, you know, if there's something else that we can do in there, just think about it more broadly, because I think it would be great to get um, more units, more density and, um, so yes, I'm I'm supportive of it, but I would even hope that we might, might even take it a little further, um, if possible. The second thing is, um, I think to go to town meeting um, with the um, view that there's going to be uh, financial support from the town provided to developers to do this um, might be a little challenging, especially since this is workforce and looking at the numbers in terms of average median income and what the prices of these units still would be. I think there might be some resistance um, from the town for providing, you know, developers with financial incentives to to do this. Wait, but, no, it that, that's $500 that's for buy down. Yeah, this is. Okay, it's not going to the developers. It's really. It's but I mean, it's also, but it's designated for this tier of housing. Yeah. For right, 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 right. But I just. So that, that money, money is, I mean, there's already a precedent. The town is already, the town manager has already designated funds right. to this tier of, of housing cost. Right. Yeah, the, the board. whether it's by a buy down or uh, some yeah. other, the, and regardless of whether it's a buy down, five hundred grand in uh, ARPA funds was intended to go that, to that's the I, housing trust. I feel like that might be something that we can wordsmith okay. later as part of the town to part town of planning or yeah the presentation it's stuff is just it can just because right. it's right. in that description. But if you've got rid of that sentence, yeah, it's, it's not something you're doing. It's already been done by yeah town manager. And it wouldn't be in the zoning bylaw. No. Yeah, that's all right. but, but, but all of that Congress wording, I think, yeah, yeah. would sort of muddy the water. Right, so we would do that. It's just okay. it's part of his presentation. has nothing to do with what we do. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So, no, I agree. I agree. It does kind of muddy the water. Position it as an incentive to get more housing that the select board has already said that's one of our goals. Right. Yes. So, regarding the density bonus, First, I have a question. So apparently no one has ever used provision B about um, smaller units with one car garages. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever used provision C about zero step entry no. with master bedroom full? No, never. Hmm. I I mean, here it is November. I realize town meeting schedule is late okay. next year, but it still seems like a little late to start. Um, hazard and guesses about should we drop it from at least 50% to at least 30% or should we raise it from 2,500 to 33,000 or some other thing? That I would feels kind of more like shooting from the A what? That feels more like shooting from the head. Exactly. Like, yeah. I, see, I feel more inclined to just do this, do I Matt's mean, proposal I'm or not. And then maybe consider density bonus things at some some later date. Later if, date. if we determine that it it could help spur something, you know, whether it's you know whatever. And, yeah. And there are enough 
developers in Concord and you know Concord residents who you know the board can put this on your you know goals for you know next year mm -hmm. get their input what would know, make on, you know how could this section change to get you to create you know more you know smaller units and mm -hmm. um and and get their feedback and ask them I'm actually, I see why they haven't used provision B. I'm a little shocked no one's ever used provision C because it doesn't cost extra money. It just changes the design of the units and it expands who you can sell them to. But, you know, obviously they have their reasons. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. Do you think? I, I don't think we touch it right now. Yeah. But, we, but it's a discussion to have. It is a discussion to have because it is, it does this bylaw does present interesting questions of whether there's low hanging fruit within the the existing rules that if they're tweaked a little bit could it produce something well as you as you point out if we've had one of these in the past three years i mean is there should we should we look at the entire thing over the next year or should we just move forward with this i i i you know i Think we ought to think about yeah i mean i think it needs it's could be useful to be addressed um but i to do it piecemeal i, I mean i just don't know that we're going to get like six, six units in the next year out of it um, i don't know you so know? so my opinion mm -hmm. <laughs> um i i think it could um what's being proposed could possibly spur you know, some additional development. Um, it is also not just an equation of the zoning bylaw. It's also an equation of available land and just the overall cost of available land and the overall increase in cost to actually develop that land. So um, an example, you can have a piece of property and um, you can put in a new subdivision road, utilities, stormwater, and get 10 houses um, or that same piece of land do um, seven A and R lots. And it may be cheaper to do seven A and R lots because the cost to develop, um, you know, just not just materials, but labor as well um, has you know far exceeded what it used to cost. Not just the the cost of the land itself, but just the cost to to build. Um, so the to give you another example, um, just when we had the meeting at three about the MBTA community zoning for larger developments. So let's take like Forest Ridge Road project. Um, it can be anywhere from two to five years to get a transformer, <laughs> an electric transformer for mm -hmm. that project. Yep, I can verify that. Yeah. So, um, you know, and and so again, that goes into just that overall carrying cost of a, you know for a, a developer. So, um, yeah. So I mean, it's it's not. You know why things are not being built, or you know why um, you know, things aren't happening in you know in you know commercial districts. It, um, you know the zoning bylaw may not amending it may not solve all these things because there's all these other pressures that are going on. So, do I think it's worthwhile um, to send it to town council and um, and you know put it forth at, to town meeting, um, I think it's worthwhile. And, um, you know, there have been zoning bylaws where, um, you know, they get amended and then a year later um, they get reamended. And sometimes, you know, sometimes in, until it gets implemented, you, you have no way of knowing, you know, whether it's gonna do what you had hoped or whether there's an unintended consequence. Um, on her to put the carrot to dangle that carrot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, 
I mean, a bone of you know a, a density bonus in development, you know, is you know it really is the 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 spreadsheet that they do. It's yes, I have a few more you know a, a few more units, and you know double the units, but there is that that cost benefit now. So you are talking, you know, more utilities, um, you know, more infrastructure. Um, so. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is administrative business. This is the time for public comment. Our public comment is limited to up to 15 minutes with no more than three min minutes allocated to any one speaker. Public comment is limited to items that are not on the agenda. So do we have anyone with any public comments? Anybody raise hands raised? There are no public hands. There are no hands raised. There are no hands in the room. So we will move on to the Economic Vitality Committee potential zoning bylaw, parking regulation amendments of Concord Center and West Concord Village Districts. Seven word title. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's accurate. It's just it's a lot by the time you're. Um. So this is a um draft bylaw um amendment um based on the conversation that the board had with the EVC chair and the economic vitality um, manager at your last meeting. Um, and uh, I did send this off to them for, you know, their, you know, to get their initial feedback. Um, and you know, not so much the, the zoning piece, but the explanation, which it comes uh, from uh, information that the economic vitality manager had provided. So I imagine, you know, they they will have you know edits um, to the explanation. So I don't think the board needs to, um, unless you have you know questions to um, that you can that we can you know formulate and send back to the EVC um, for uh, for them to provide additional input. The the bylaw itself, um, the actual amendment. Um, this this just needs to go to town council. Um, I'm I'm I have thought you know about this um, over and over again and tried to think about you know what could possibly be an unintended consequence. Um, and I'm just having a very challenging time wrapping my head around how how to um how how to write a, a bylaw to achieve what it is um the EVC is looking for uh, and within the parameters of the zoning bylaw um, but also it comes down to um the requirements of the zoning act and this is where town council will come in and um you know there's you know, the zoning act requires un uniformity um, in how you treat um, you know uses in zoning districts, and so that's that would be where town councils um, you know, can can help you know flush this out. If if how I thought about this, if if that if that doesn't work in this format, um, I would. I can't, I cannot currently think of another way to achieve this without um, significant revisions to um, the the zoning bylaw in, in some manner. But um, I think town councils look at it will help kind of zero in. And I can also say personally, I've been having more trouble justifying this than I thought I would because where parking waivers don't seem to be that hard to get in the sense of you have Cafe Nero, you have all these businesses that manage to come in and get parking waivers um, based on existing uses of a, you know, the property or whatever. And then to say that those now travel with the land as a of use right as provided you don't do certain things. It, it, it just... It strikes me as something that we are 
somehow codifying someone making their rent too high. That like, look, this has limited, like then Philip's paint keeps getting brought up. Philip's paint is empty. Philip's paint is empty. They're also trying to charge $1.7 million for the building. So maybe that building isn't worth that much because it doesn't have any parking and it has limited uses. And we're trying to say, oh, well, regardless of what goes in, provided it's just an office and retail, it can do whatever it wants and doesn't have to solve the problem. And I'm not saying it has to solve the problem, but the price of the building and the price of the, uh, you know, it, it needs to be reflected in, in how that building is used and developed. And where there is limited parking and there is this quaint feel, no one is proposing to tear that building down and put up a parking lot. They're trying to figure out how to, make, and I just, I have trouble where we're saying no matter what they do, it'll be fine and that they have a right to do it as opposed to saying, hey, find someone who is willing to pay what you want for it and we'll see if it can work. I don't know. It just, it seems to be like, I don't know. It's, just, it's too, it, it see, it's feeling too far for me. Um, and the fact that it's empty is more a reflection of how much somebody's trying. You know, if an art gallery went, wanted to go in tomorrow and pay three dollars for rent, it would be full. But at some point, the landlord and the tenants have to meet, and we can't blame parking for causing grief. I don't know. I just, I just have trouble with it. Well, I have a different problem with it, which is what we're trying to prevent here is a situation where. The building is using up so much of the site that every last little scrap of the rest of it is made up in parking, which may be zero parking spaces right. if that's what it well, is. No, but if you, if, you hold, if I could just finish this thought, and and what we want to do is prevent the problem where anybody who wants to go into the building has to take a chance on going through the whole permit process to get a waiver, whereas they could just um, simply put in a new business without having to go through all of that trouble if they were allowed to with knowing they wouldn't have to put in additional parking. But that's not what this says. And what if there's a building uh, that's so big and it provides two parking spaces and somebody wants to come in and uh, make a new business that requires 20 parking spaces, but there's also a lawn on the property. We don't wanna say, well, you don't have to put in the required parking, you can keep your lawn. We want to say you don't have to put in the required build uh, parking because it would make you tear down the building. So the the specific way in which this is written seems to miss what we're trying. But we're only to talking about Concord Center Business District and West and Concord, Concord Village. Village. And uh, why is it only West Concord Village, not West Concord Business? Was that the intent of so the? West the West Concord Business mm -hmm. um, District um, is developed significantly different than the village district. It is, and so is the rest. So this... and, and, and most of the business districts, they they have an element of parking already. Yeah. Um, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, Wash and Wag, the, you know, the strip mall. Mm -hmm. You know, those are all biz the business district. They have parking. So this is really just chosen for the two parts of town where there really isn't any parking on these right. properties. Right, so Concord Center, you know. They both two -thirds of those parking. You know, the two-thirds yeah. of those, you know, properties yeah. in Concord Center, the building takes up but where, the where whole there, property. But where there are waivers in those, and, and again, I wasn't part of any of those discussions, where there are waivers in those discussions, aren't those discussions generally, there is no parking, and then they work with the landlord to make sure that there aren't going to be extra people on shifts that don't actually need to be there, get sense of whether, you know, like, like, it seems like that's part of the process of understanding what the business is and whether that's appropriate for them to have no parking. I've never heard of anyone saying, well, there's no parking, so you can't do the use you want. And I've never heard of that. I mean, I understand, like, apparently Nero going in was painful. Well, it was also at a moment where no one really wanted Nero to go in, so people made it painful. Um, now, I don't know if the result would be the same if they were coming into West Concord. You know, because now people have seen the pro or whatever or comfortable with that. Um, I I don't know. I just don't know. 
I don't know if the experience of having empty storefronts for short periods of time in eras of high inflation, retail uncertainty, and high prices is the moment where we say, great, we're going to upend the current system, which at least seems to have some control over it, not control, but some thought behind it to say it's a free for all or used by right. Because now, you know, if you have Phillips paint, Phillips paint's been out for four years or whatever. This is the only example I can think of because it's the only empty storefront I can remember that stayed empty for a while. Um, but I don't know what their, their parking arrangements were for their staff who worked there. Those are probably gone away. So is it appropriate for us to say that they have a right to do whatever Phillips was doing, even if it was, you know, they were leasing spots. And now all of a sudden these people are showing up working somewhere without having done that background, presented the town with that evidence of that background mm. and saying, yeah, you can do that. I mean, I remember that Asian Gourmet had leased spots from an office park down the street because they didn't need them at the same hours. So for Dunkin' Donuts to go in and say, hey, Asian Gourmet didn't need parking, or they, they dealt with it, but it was a personal license between two people, business changes, and they can't get that. Well, they, they have a right in the zoning bylaw to do it, but they don't have the evidence where that parking is now. So does that create its own cascading questions of like, it's, I have trouble with it. Well, yeah. it, it, I don't know. It's, it seems to me like we've had this conversation now just recently about housing and through zoning and density bonus, we're um, trying to get more housing PRDs. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're in the same situation with, with retail. I mean, it's, it's, you know, Bandol I mean, you can think Bandoleros, you know, that site was empty, I'm sure, four years as well. Oh, but kids. there was plenty of parking. I mean, it wasn't a parking issue. For, it was just that. Or whatever. Well, yeah. I don't know if it was it's the rent or whatever, whatever. but there it wasn't a parking issue. Yeah. 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 It yeah. wasn't a parking issue. It was an economic issue. And I, I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. But, but, um, so it seems to me, um one of our opportunities is to support things that people in town want they want housing and they want retail and restaurants and all of uh the things that make for but you know livable communities and um and so um you know that and they want private schools to send the kids to and so we give them parking you know so it's it's like town assets are to some extent put to work to support um uh amenities and uh so streetscape at, that's vibrant is an amenity and i don't think it's inappropriate that we'd be supportive of that and i don't know that um uh, that that isn't part of why we should be rethinking this. Um, so that's... Well, sorry, before, you asked, sorry but... if I could just interrupt you for one second. We do have somebody who's been mm -hmm. patient. Uh, Mimi, um, I can't... Granny. 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 The line of the news often. So um, just to kind of go over what the proposal of the Economic Vitality Committee is, um, our proposal is for all of the commercial districts. So that would be not just Concord Center and West Concord Village, but um, Nine Acre Corner, uh, Thoreau Depot, all of the places where there's kind of smaller scale retail. Um, so uh, right now the committee sort of merts missing it a little bit, but the core part of our, our proposal is kind of that whole set that's in the zoning, um, uh, the list of different districts. Um, and I think part of why we're sort of focusing specifically on those districts is one, it's within the charge of the Economic Vitality Committee. Uh, but we're looking at the town is trying to shift the um, burden of tax revenue or tax, um, the tax burden from residential and rebalance it a little bit more into commercial. And we're recognizing that Concord likes the character of its historic districts. It's not necessarily looking to expand the areas where commercial activity is happening. Right now, it's only 3% of the town. So we're looking at how can we strengthen the existing properties without 
fostering new development, um, with not increasing stormwater runoff, without uh, keeping our neighborhoods, um, the streetscape more active. And I, I'm a little concerned, I hear what folks are sort of saying like this, could be unintended consequences. But I think right now there is an unintended consequence of how the parking requirements are now, which is it creates an incentive for lower um, active uses to be in the existing historic properties. So if you've got a office use that's in there that has a low parking requirement and you wanted to put something that's more active that actually would contribute to um, a greater, act more commercial activity in the district as whole, and actually would increase the value of that property, um, we're creating a barrier for that. And oftentimes, kind of going back to like, if you look at Cafe Nero, there's no parking connected with that building. There's no physical way in which they can do so. And in terms of even spaces that they can lease within proximate area to that building is limited. Um, and what happens in a practical means is it, it's a disincentive for anybody even considering coming in. Um, and or for them to um, uh, it devalues the individual properties. So I understand of like, OK, maybe Phillips paint isn't worth, um, you know, the amount that they're asking for. But if they do get that kind, it, it adds the value, which then goes back to shifting the um, balance of the um, the uh, higher making higher value of our histor existing historic properties, which is going to help historic preservation. It's going to help our tax base. Um, so uh, I, I see a lot of benef uh, benefits to kind of thinking a little bit about this approach um, and maybe looking at individual properties and sort of like what would be sort of some of the worst case scenarios and how those are limited in lots of other ways. Um, because when I kind of do some of those case scenarios, um, it's really not uh, going to be a massive change to the districts. I have a question that might, might be a little technical and I'm not the lady, but so bear with me. So this started with a question of I noticed that the text was proposed to be in the combined business slash residence section of your guidelines. And the wording No, it's in it's in two sections. Well, oh yeah, okay. But let me hear me out. Yes. If I can explain. Because my real question was the wording in the draft is a little different than the wording in your memo. So maybe this will get to it. It says a change in use from one permitted use to a combined business residence use, which I think implies that this would only apply in an area that the new use is a combined business residence. In your memo, you had a slightly different word that I think said from one permitted use to a new permitted use or a combined business residence use. So I just wanted to clarify which um, so, so in in the memo it referenced so the actual bylaw yeah, yeah. amendment is yeah. to two different sections. Yep, I got it. I'm talking about the wording that's in here specifically. So yep. it says from it says from one permitted use to a combined business residence use. So that would be the wording under sec subsection four two three five. Right. And then there would be um, it's different. Okay. It's Maybe different it's than right. table four. So table four would be a second, okay. would be a okay. second different right. amendment. Okay, so I missed And that. the reason for that is because 4235 is about combined business residents, right? It's Whereas it's footnote one in table four minimum parking applies to business, business in general. Yeah. yeah. So okay. the parking requirement for combined business residents yeah. is listed under the residential uses. That's, uh, yeah, so, so I got that. I thought it was, I, I saw an earlier version. Yeah. I thought this was the same text, so I missed that. So I got it. So that's why yeah. there's two different, I got it. two different wordings because they have to go in two different sections. So, and really my intention was, where is it coming to apply to business use? But you got it. So my other question was, why not the throw depot business? I, I don't, I'm, 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 so that's a, a misunderstanding on my part oh, when, okay. when, um, you know, the chair of the EVC and Mimi were here last time, okay. they gave examples. So Okay. Um, I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I just tried to write this. If, yeah. if they're, yeah. if their intention is to have it for all business districts, okay. um, then, you know, you would just strike, you know, you would strike those two words. Yeah. I mean, yeah so those, those two districts. 
Although then I wonder why we would give a free pass to properties that have space that could be turned into parking that does not contain a building. And uh, well, okay, so let me, I wanted to make a comment, which I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding the wording here. It says, which does not increase the square footage of the building and does not increase the required parking. So how can a change in use increase the square footage of the building? Maybe you mean a case in which there's not only a change in use, but they're also um, looking for a building permit to modify the size of the building. But it, it strikes me as just a little bit odd the way the proposed language is phrased here. So and then, where, Graham, where Graham Nutt is, uh -huh. you know, that building uh -huh. has four different tenants. Uh -huh. um, somebody could go in and let's say Cafe Nero, the tenant next door went out of business and Cafe Nero expanded into oh but that that's tenant. not changing the square footage of the building that's changing the square footage of the the something that's changing the square footage of the building means you know like uh right adding bricks or removing them yeah. or something so um, it, that's just a wordsmithing so yeah it's not it, it it's not the use it's the, the as, business the as something. i said um, the, and town council hasn't looked at it yet uh, and then it also says shall not be required to provide additional parking. And I wondered if that should say increase the amount of parking provided on site. But then after what Andrew said, I wonder if it would be better to like <clears throat> reference some kind of checklist that no, says uh, in order to make use, in order to be excused from providing the additional parking, you must take a you know if, if the previous business had off-site parking um arrangements you must have equal or better ones but it's starting to get really hairy i i, I complicated i don't know yeah, yeah. Uh, uh so i mean you you can a change in use from one permitted use to a combined business residence use which does not increase the square footage of the use of the well, business, but it, uh, but it, it well, hmm. it, it's not. You're, so yeah, it's just it's for me where, not, where you have a change of where you have a you have a it's a non-conforming basically a non-conforming building. Yes. And so any use in it is non-conforming. Oh, so, oh, so as a actually, result, the economic vitality committee isn't saying it's a non-conforming building because they wanted to apply across the board globally, whether it's conforming or not. It was just a change in use, not new development. So that's even more expansive. Yeah. It's quite expansive, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I would like it to be less onerous for no, I a business to, you know, a change of use that doesn't really change anything. I'm just having, I'm struggling to figure out how to say that. I'm just, well, I'm also struggling why you were right to it. <laughs> That's the part that I don't understand. Like, well, I, I, I get it. that the use had the same requirements. Right. Right. But if the use has the same requirements, that, that doesn't mean that how you conformed at the time necessarily carries forward. So you have a property that you were able to get eight people on the top shift because you're renting space from the church, whatever church is saying, yeah, hundred bucks a month, fine. Next person comes in and immediately pisses everyone off. And the church says, no, they have a right to do it, but now they have a shift of eight people who have nowhere to park. And instead of the town kind of getting involved and saying, hey, in order to do this, you got to show us where these people are going to park. They're now taking eight street spots every day of the week. Well, well, no. Why is that? I because mean, the church was up and Because the church they just said, no, it, it's, they, don't have a, they don't have a deeded right to those spots. That's the concern I have. You know, and, and they brought it up. They brought it up last week. The mm -hmm. prior occupant mm -hmm. had to find eight space. But they had an arrangement that was a personal license. 
It doesn't matter. They had to find eight spaces, and the new tenant would have to find But then eight we would spaces. have to say but there has that to be a mechanism the somewhere in the bar. This just says they have a right to do it because it didn't change. We would have to, that's what we I was talking right. about a checklist. That part of the checklist would be if the prior use had some kind of arrangement for off site parking, you know, then the new one would also like have to. Mark have was, Mark, and this Mark does not say that. Brought up the example of the, the, um, Oh God, the art gallery that has the ability to park in the church parking lot. Right. It's an art gallery and, and studio space that has that, that ability. If they sell to a private gallery, that private gallery may not have the thing. The use hasn't necessarily changed, but the relationship of the party all of a sudden, they may not like you holding weekend events and using their parking because the, the, the art gallery knew the people involved and the relationships and the whatever, and then the next person walks in and says, those are mine. We're giving them some sort of and hard the church has a right to say no. Yeah, right. The art gallery, if it's uh, if I bought the art gallery, mm -hmm. um, I, I would have the same requirements that the art gallery had, which was I'd have to find. That's not what but this that's not what this says. says though. This says, as long as it doesn't change, you can do what you want. Well, then, uh, yeah, that's okay. that's the concern. Okay. Yeah. Well, I then I would concur that the sit that the situationally it should be the same. But we would have to find some way of saying that in that we could write into the bylaw that whatever well, that, that the, the art and gallery this is, this is, that, this is, that the prior occupant never had a a, a, a waiver that they didn't have. To. To have parking. Well, they do. Um, so, what did it generally? So, um, uh, I can't think of. Um, there have been, you know, other projects where somebody has come in, got a special permit for relief from parking, and they have, um, you know, so actually, your your example of Asian gourmet, um, they actually did get relief. From parking, they got a special permit, and they were required to enter into a lease with the office building for their employees. That was part of the special permit review. Um, they had to, you know, submit the the draft lease. That draft lease had to be executed as part of, you know, the special permit. There's been, um, I can't, I just, I can't think of other examples, but that. That has been a mechanism but, of relief and working. And part of it, uh, from what so I've seen. So when Duncan went in, they um, significantly that was all, yeah. less parking, less parking required because no second floor seating anymore. Um, the number of less employees stuff. on the largest shift was significantly so less. All... So they were able to accommodate through a redesign of the property, all the required spaces they need on the property. And like, and, and I remember- Even though there was no change of use. But I also remember reading the 99. Uh, that was a change right. of use, that was a decrease. But they still proved that they could do it. Um, but like the 99, when they went out and West Village, right. to whatever it's called, came in, they presented and basically said, there's been a restaurant of this size here forever. Mm -hmm. But it's it wasn't fine. a change of use. It's it fine. And everyone went, you're yeah. right, it's fine. And there was no, they didn't have to do parking analysis. They didn't have to do all this stuff. If someone like literally went into Phillips Paint and said, we're going to do a retail paint store with the office above. Poof, they're in. Check. It, 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 it's, it's, it's literally another application that doesn't delay anything. It's where you're doing something dramatically different that everyone throws their hands up and says, let's just look at this for a second. You prove it, and we're good. And I've never heard of anyone not being able to prove it. You know, saying, "Look, there's," you know, and and every downtown Concord's like the perfect example of there is parking available. It's just not convenient. It's not exactly where I want to park, so therefore it's not there. Every time someone says does a parking study, there's like always four hundred empty spots within a quarter mile. Because it's just, you know, every street has parking. Every, you know, most of it's unmetered or unenforced or whatever. But you know what I mean? That it, and to sit there and say, like, we're not going to, you know, we as the 
we as the planning board think it's appropriate not to look at it anymore. I don't know. You know, and, and I'm all for business development. I'm all for things being used, but I just don't know where this goes. I don't know. If we could find some way to actually say that that covers all the bases and doesn't make things worse, I could go with it. I'm just not figuring out how, how to say that. Isn't that what the current thing is, though? Well, but it's extra onerous to have to go through that whole process. Well, maybe, it maybe, it's that the, maybe it's that the extra process is too onerous. Well, more than maybe if we made the well, whole process less onerous for everyone, yeah, it would be better. Too. Yeah, that that the, that it's really that the 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 appeals process related to parking is too onerous, not that we just have to get rid of it. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Oops. I thought maybe had her hand up, but now she doesn't. <laughs> um I don't know. I, I just I just don't love this as something and I'm I'm not a hundred percent on board with standing the me or someone saying that they as the planning board being like, we're going to solve parking by just letting everyone do what they want is going to fly without some sort of like... Well, we weren't trying to solve parking. Yeah, we're but trying, you know what I mean? That, like, we're like trying even to solve changes of use. But even pretending that that's a major concern when it comes to empty... You, I've never heard of anyone not doing something because well, of the but changes. But it was very hard for Cafe Nero to go through months of... But that was also... I think I think that was also a lot of people were upset that it was like the first real chain store and that it was like mm -hmm. we are gonna we're gonna dig our heels in and make this painful and now you saw what happened with the change of use from fat face to well but that was chain to chain so but but that's what I'm saying is is that it wasn't you know a change of I don't think that if they had said it was going to be a snack bar anyone would have had any real you know we're gonna do you know you know what I mean like like a or was it before the formula business bylaw applied to downtown so. Concord? I think so. so that, that could part have been of part of it. For what cafe? For cafe Nero. Nero. Yeah. No, they that was after. They were okay. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I just remember that it was really aggressive. Oh, okay. Um, Mimi, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. Um, so going back a little bit to some of the uh, examples that you've been giving, because I I think we've been kind of conflating public parking and private parking. Um, because right now, the, the, when we talk a little bit about people using up the streetscape uh, curbside and and pu uh, public parking lots, that that really has to do with the town's responsibility to manage that parking. Um, and even if there was a giant public parking lot next to the um, some of these businesses, uh, like for the example of Cafe Nero, that the commercial property can't kind of get credit for those spaces or if they're right next to public transit or right next to a bike share that that's not part of the calculation that's you know kind of explaining what um what's available for the business um and i think that when you brought up a little bit of like there is a lot of parking available already in these business districts it kind of proves the point of like the uh example of like requiring more parking spaces just adds especially private ones as the zoning is required, just accumulates more uh, parking lots that will sit empty uh, unless they're kind of in the, uh, that particular moment that they're being used by the business. Well, when you say, I mean, I just, again, I, I, I've been li lived around here for a while, but haven't been obviously involved in this capacity for all that long. It, on the commercial side, has anyone built more parking like 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 where they're in these districts and said oh god i you know i i'm i'm i've got a 5000 square foot lot i better to dedicate half of it to parking or do they immediately just apply for a waiver because that's clearly you know and that's the part i'm having trouble with where it says like oh well the, the private need it says we need to have all this parking well if realistically no one's building that parking it, it's a requirement in the sense of to build as of right, but no one's doing that. They're all they're all like getting waivers and, and doing all these things. So it just, it doesn't strike me as that convincing to say the, the rules are like, yes, the rules are we should level half of downtown and it should be parking. 
but that's so clearly not what's there. Yeah, so I don't is, know. There is more parking being built. It's being built by the town and they take uh, paint brushes out <laughs> and they mark off sure. more spaces. And so you know, when I, I live on Main Street and there didn't used to be that many parking spaces on Main Street and now they're more and now they're going up into various other, you know, Right. streets in the downtown area and you can say uh what everyone says which is there's a lot of parking available be, you know because um people can actually walk a block you know mm -hmm. <laughs> where they didn't have to walk a block well it's a it's a big change to people who used to pull up and you know yeah uh go, go um wherever they wanted but uh now they have to walk a little ways but so the town is providing that amenity to the Cafe Nero's and the uh, Concord Academies and so on. And I guess, um, it, you know, it's really a matter of, uh, you know, the decision on the yeah. part of the town. I thought we uh, do take uh, public parking into account, but we take it into account as part of the onerous waiver process. process. Right. So you say that there's public parking available. We've done a, you know, we they leveraged the last study that says that it's, you know, this much is available, nothing's changed. Therefore, you know, no one has to walk very far. This isn't going to create that much impact, but somebody has to say it, not just, you know, and then that's also, you know, Cafe Nero goes out. Well, then a new cafe comes in. It's a cafe. Great. Well, if they're preparing food on site, that's slightly different than it was before because you know, the kitchen might be 20% larger. It's not a change in use and it's not not increasing the square footage because they're now using the back room for prep space. But now their largest shift is three times the size because they're baking their own bread. You know, all these things are part of the discussion that's supposed to be had in the appeals process so that everybody's comfortable and everybody gets to yes. It's not someone else's, but I don't know. That's my... And, the fact that we're having trouble even phrasing how it works is makes me concerned too because it makes it novel and when it's novel it's a problem for zoning because <laughs> it becomes challengeable um i don't know where that leads us but so can i just ask a question what's missing is the undocumented waiver that they got the first time technically so that there was a use that had some unwritten or private arrangement to support the parking, right? Mm -hmm. But do we even police that today mm -hmm. on a regular basis? We don't. So when they get their application, they they prove it, but then things could change. We're not policing that on a regular basis. But if basis, somebody so. complained about a business, then we might look into then the it. building commission yeah. would, would do something. Yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden everyone who works at at um you know, whatever, yeah, parking yeah, in the rail shop parking. That's what you're struggling with, right? Because the new business, you want them to honor the old arrangement is really what you're looking for. Well, that's what this, that's what this kind yeah, of says. Yeah, it yeah, says, it says that there was an arrangement available and you therefore have it, so we're not even going to worry. Right, but you, you want to solidify that somehow. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. it, like, well, it might be doable. I'm wondering if it's doable for TM 2025. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I'll have to, I'll have to think about it and um and yeah, because you'd already mentioned there was concern about how this this could be problematic based on how the zoning bylaw is supposed to treat everybody the same. And this treats well, different. that that would be you know that is definitely input from town council. So. Um, so I, I'll set up a meeting with town council and you know, we can brainstorm on, on, on how to, you know, how this might be able to be done under the current zoning. Mm -hmm. Mimi, are you aware of what any other towns do? do you, have you There's done lots of other... Lots of other communities have removed their parking requirements in 
the small business districts. Um, in some cases, they've done it as overlay districts, like as an overlay in those districts because they were worried about changing their, it was very complicated for those spaces. Um, in other places, they've just sort of comparable to this one, removing the uh, requirements, e even if it's new construction. Um, so this is actually less expansive than some other communities are doing it. Maynard's is one that's done well, it. I was going to ask maybe if you could um, uh, send on a, a list that might be helpful if we could think about that. Which towns have comparable cut of relief? Is what yeah. You're yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, part of what uh, what inspired the Economic Vitality Committee to work on this is that you know we've seen the studies that have come out of the the planning board in the town showing that the parking requirements in Concord are higher than industry standards, um, and we recognize that there's incentive to actually have more active uses in the historic districts to disincentivize your professional offices on the ground floor to have them more active. We're vastly constrained by um, sewer capacity, which is limiting what, you know, it's going to be pretty much impossible to put in any kind of new food use. Um, so uh, we're trying to be creative with the, the various constraints. And we recognize that this might be um, an unusual thing for Concord to think about um, and that there uh, there is going to be, you know, some changes along the way. But looking at oftentimes the way that existing parking requirements have the 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 numbers when you actually dig into them and in, in what it translates to oftentimes it's one use that would have you know 10 parking spaces required that otherwise would be grandfathered in and a different use that similarly would have 10 parking spaces so it's often like for like um and i i recognize sort of seeking a waiver and articulating the 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 regular uh thing of saying there's not parking here. The parking study um, shows that there is parking available. You will know, we'll, we'll be reaching out to other private property owners. It's it's almost like asking each new business coming in to do the same dance. Um, and, and if the waivers are regularly granted, it means that there's the same outcome. Um, and just recognizing for businesses that the planning board is just one of the hoops that they're going through. They're getting a lot of reviews along the way. Um, and so we're trying to find where are the places where there can be some flexibility and recognizing that there's going to be uh, negligible or zero impact in the district and that we can welcome the type of uses that Concord is saying it's wanting to bring into the districts. So, so Elizabeth, if um, uh, if the art center had a waiver based on getting eight spaces from the church. Um, the town would have a record of that. And if someone came in and purchased the art center, then they sh we sh should be able to go and find out that they had that agreement. And and that the new tenant then would have to follow those rules. And that would be... Yeah, I'm not sure how you would, in, in, how would enforce... You would enforce that. Yeah, I'm not how, sure how you would be able to enforce that. Um, in terms of zoning. Yeah, well, because, you, you know, you're talking about the, the sale of, you know, the art center to somebody else who's buying the art center. The, the town probably wouldn't even know or be notified, um, just be a private sale and somebody coming in says, okay, well, where's your, where do your employees park? So, oh, well, we have an agreement with the church. Like, well, I want the same agreement. So part of that private sale negotiation, they would probably negotiate with the church and get the same thing. So, you know, the, so if, and if somebody bought Cafe Nero and all they did was change the signage, you know, that's a private sale. The town's not going to be a party to that. Right. So, right. Um, but we're we're talking about um, uh, if the art center became a 
uh, yoga studio. I don't it, know. It, 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 yeah. or, it became, or, you know, a pizza restaurant and the church just hates pizza because they're just, settled. you know, the church yeah. of anti-pizza, yeah. you know? Um, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't, I can't answer it's, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you'll bring that to town council and see if something's even oh. possible, I guess. Or well, I, so, mean, I don't know if it's bad. I don't know. So obviously, you know the the, the um, so obviously the current wording is not you know what the EDC is looking for. So mm -hmm. um, I, I'll wait for their feedback and um, and then forward it to. To town council. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, the next agenda item is planning board liaison town planning. Anyone have any liaison updates? I do not. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, so I apologize, but. Um, update for 275 Forest Ridge Road, the comprehensive permit. Um, they did submit um, the bias plans um, and um, gave an initial presentation to the Board of Appeals on the 30th. Uh, and it's been continued to December 5th. Yeah, December 5th. Um, did not receive everything, so we are slowly getting things submitted just got a land, the land revised landscape plan on um, Friday um, but we're posting things as as we get them to the website but that's um, that's the current update on where that comprehensive permit is we still have a schedule for next year yet yes we just finished it so <laughs> we're going to be sending it out to the board uh tomorrow it's uh um, it it it's quite challenging because um, a, um, a lot of you are going back to in person. So, but if you looked at the town calendar, I think for tonight, I think there's something like eight different meetings going on in town. Yeah. <laughs> How is the committee on reducing the number of committees doing? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> The committee or it's, or it's subcommittee. <laughs> oh. Um, uh, and the last agenda item we have is the minutes for the 1029 meeting. That's what it says. We sent out on Tuesday. I think we did get a meeting. The minutes yeah, earlier this week. Yeah, I think you got the set from Heather. Yeah. So I don't know if anyone else had any additional edits. I did see that they reflected some input. And so we can do a roll call vote to approve those minutes. Second. And then I'll go um, Pat to approve the minutes. Without being on mute. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there, oh, there we go. Oh. Thank you. Um, I was not at that meeting. Oh, okay. You're allowed to vote. It's up to you. You're allowed to vote. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I I will I, I will not vote. I wasn't at that meeting. Okay, you'll abstain. Okay, okay. 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 Yes. Okay. yes. So, aye. And I, Andrew, am also an aye. So those minutes are approved. And with that, that's the end of our regularly scheduled program.